Welcome back to New Rockstars. Quentin Tarantino officially canceled his planned 10th and final film, The Movie Critic, that was supposed to come out next year, leaving the filmmaker's future wide open. It was the biggest story in Hollywood this week, and we have to talk about it today. We're going to talk about what really happened with this film, The Movie Critic, what it was going to be, and answer the question of will Tarantino return to the Kill Bill franchise for Volume 3? We're diving into the Tarantino Cinematic Universe because, yes, his movies are all connected in a very violent cinephilic timeline. This is the Sneak Peek, New Rockstar's weekly show where we discuss the future of fandoms. Jessica Clement is out this week, but joining me is Brandon Barrick. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing great, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. I love Quentin Tarantino's films. Uh, I got into them at a young age when I shouldn't have been watching them, uh, and I finally grew into an age where I was able to see them in theaters. I mean, I remember that year in between Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2 was just like, ugh. It was, it was it was such a long wait. I loved those movies so much. I think I saw the first one in theaters like four or five times. It was so good. Um, I, I love Tarantino's films and what he does. You know, I love any auteur filmmaker who's making their own original projects. Um, and I, I don't want him to quit at 10, but I love this little yeah. drama of like, we know what the 10th movie is and now he's thrown us out into the wild. We don't know what he's going to do next. You know, it's crazy. So um, for anyone watching, you know, our New Rockstar's office may or may not be in Burbank, California. And Brandon and I were <laughs> grabbing a drink at the Inkwell Tavern. Shout out Inkwell Tavern. One of the best places to grab a drink yes. in all of Burbank. Uh, we're grabbing a drink and this was on Tuesday night and we were just talking about like, I don't know why we were talking about the movie Critic or Tarantino, but then little do we know the next day this news would come out and it blew our minds. It's our that, fault. Maybe you know, he was at the Inkwell. We did. He heard us chatting and he was like, you know what? I can do better for the new Rockstars channel than the movie Critic. I got a better <laughs> final movie in me. But I feel the same way about Tarantino. Like, I, he was just someone that my brother recommended to me because um, we had had, like, maybe the Sundance Channel or IFC or something like that. And my brother's like, hey, I'm headed out, but I see next on, like, the, the TV schedule is going to be Pulp Fiction. You should watch that movie. And I must have been, like, 14, yeah. 15, <laughs> old enough to watch it. But I, it blew my mind watching this movie. Uh, and then I, like, devoured everything I could get my hands on. Uh, I think at that point I might have been... I think Kill Bill Volume 1 was out, mm. and my friend had the DVD. We watched it at a cast party for the musical. Uh, like, some of us just went in a room and watched Kill Bill. I love that. Blew my mind. And then when it came, when the part two came out in theaters, Volume 2, like, I got the soundtracks for both. Oh. I think that was the first movie I got yes. the soundtracks for. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah like, the, t t I think we can admit Tarantino is a deeply strange human being sure you know maybe a problematic person you know uh <laughs> I, I, yeah. I you know after finding out like what happened to uma thurman on the set yeah. she was injured in like an accident where like she really yeah. shouldn't have been in the car and like you yeah. know quentin's pushing for it you know and yeah. you know things he's said in his films as characters maybe as himself i don't know if it's okay you know uh yeah. times change and we try and evolve and be better people uh but you can't argue that like he is putting out unique uh uh, movies that are trying to say something and they have a very distinct visual style, a very distinct written style. I mean, what Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction did for cinema in the 90s is like pretty incredible and like certainly yeah. has its ripple effects across cinema history. Uh, so right. having a, a, a director like this who's, you know, only in his 60s, I think, uh, or close to his 60s, he's probably in his 60s now. Uh, yeah, having no. him say like, I'm going to hang it up after this last movie when you have, you know, Scorsese just this last year putting out a banger of a film uh, in yeah. his 90s. Like, why is this guy quitting? Don't go away. We need you making Don't quit. movies. Especially, I think it's important for directors to be mentors to the younger generation mm. uh, and not to opine, you know, their film philosophy as much because, you know, we know Tarantino loves to do that. But, you know, I think it's great and it's really important for directors like Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese and Christopher Nolan and, yeah, Quentin Tarantino to, to mentor the younger generation of filmmakers and to encourage them to make bold choices and to find their own own individual voice and i think you know tarantino is one of these directors like wes anderson you know he's, he's just such an auteur and he's so bold and then you know his films just by looking at them right you know you can watch a movie without seeing the titles on it and you just know that this is a quentin tarantino yeah. movie. 
Totally. Uh, and you know when a movie's trying to be a Quentin Tarantino movie. Or when it's and trying not quite to be, getting yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's go through all of his movies and we'll talk about what happened with the film critic. Uh, and there may be some like difficult to talk about reasons why. Sure, sure. But I think uh, it does open the door for some more interesting options for Tarantino. Maybe you can come back to the film critic mm. as like his 20th movie Okay, or something. okay. So the 10 or the nine movies he has made so far... Um, include Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, and then Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2. Quentin Tarantino considers them to be one movie, yeah. even though it was released as two. Uh, and then Death Proof, that was part of the Grindhouse uh, feature that he released with Robert Rodriguez. Um, and then Inglorious Bastards, then Django Unchained, and then Hateful Eight. The Hateful Eight was number eight. Clever. And then the ninth film was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then the tenth one was going to be the movie critic, um brandon why don't you break down what we know about the movie yeah so he announced he's gonna do this 10th movie the movie critic um you know it was gonna be about uh a movie critic in in 1977 california right uh and it was known that he kind of initially drew inspiration from this like cynical movie critic that quentin grew up reading and there was a speculation for a while that was this critic known as pauline kale who wrote for The New Yorker, but that was since like disputed by Quentin Tarantino. Uh, and instead, the main character would have been based on an even lesser known critic uh, who wrote for, quote, a porno rag that Tarantino read when he was growing up in the 70s. Uh, uh, Tarantino described this critic as like, quote, his reviews were a cross between early Howard Stern and what Travis Bickle might be if he were uh-huh. a film critic. Film critic. Uh, Travis Bickle, of course, from Taxi Driver. Uh, right. One of those characters who the the wrong people associate with, right? They they get the wrong yes. message from... They see Travis Bickle as uh-huh. a hero when he is not a hero, uh-huh. right? He's not. Um, no. And Tarantino kind of uh, referenced him by saying, like, think about Travis's di- uh, diary entries, right? Not I very see. nice, not very clean. And when Tarantino's talked about this this uh, person in other interviews, right? You know, he said he said things like, ah, oh, the things he wrote in his magazines, you know, they were not of the time. They were maybe a little racist, blah, blah, blah. Which, you know, Tarantino's been accused of being a little racist in his films and using language that he should not be using, uh, especially as we look back on them. Uh, so people mm-hmm. assumed, uh, kind of doing their research and figure out who this guy was, they, they're pretty sure it's the, uh, the critic character is based on uh, a guy named William Mangold, who was like a little known film critic and porn historian, who uh, Quentin Tarantino has actually mentioned on his podcast, his video archives podcast for, before. So people kind of uh-huh. did the math and figured out who this guy was. And Tarantino said he was a guy who was like in his 30s, but he wrote like kind of like a, as if he were like a salty old 55 year old. Uh, mm-hmm. And then Tarantino actually like, looked into this guy and figured out that he like passed away in his thirties, you know, probably mm-hmm. from complications from like alcoholism and stuff. Sure. So he's kind of had this like sitting in his mind. Right. Uh, and if you think about what we know, like the movie critic was going to take place in 1977 in California. Now in that year in cinema alone, uh, some big films came big out, year. right? You had big star year, yeah. Wars, you had close encounters of the third kind. You had Annie Hall, you had a racer head, from David mm. Lynch, uh, Suspiria, yeah. like a, a very intense, like a horror movie. And then one mm. of uh, Tarantino's personal favorite movies called Rolling Thunder came out in 1977. That movie was written by Paul Schrader, who also wrote Taxi Driver, uh, yeah. and who Tarantino really likes and has talked with and worked with, or not worked with, but like talked to and kind of like, you know, they've had meetings of the minds. He's told Paul Schrader how much he loves Rolling Thunder. I was not familiar with Rolling Thunder. I don't know if you're familiar with this film. I'm not very familiar with it. I, I just know that the same guy who wrote Taxi Driver wrote Right. It. I looked it up. I mean, it's a wild, like, very 70s trailer. It's about, like, a Vietnam vet who is – his he's robbed and his, his son is killed – and like he's got PTSD and his hand is like injured and he gets a gun and he goes on like revenge. So like Tarantino loves this movie from the 70s. Uh, and so there was so Paul Schrader was actually at an event. And he was kind of talking. This was back in December of 2023. and He was talking about this movie critic movie and he had been talking to Tarantino about it. Uh, and one thing he brought up that was kind of interesting was he was saying that like. We know in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, right, that like Tarantino kind of revisited some moments in cinema and television history and kind of Mm -hmm. inserted the fake actor Rick Dalton, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, into these moments. And it sounded like (laughs) he he wanted to do that with more movies that Tarantino loved from the 70s, right? And uh, Mm -hmm. Paul Schrader had even said that 
uh, Tarantino had asked permission to shoot the ending of Rolling Thunder based on the original screenplay that uh, Paul Schrader had written and that had been watered down uh, for for the audiences in our universe. But as we know, the Tarantino universe is very different. Uh, It's much more violent. And basically Mm -hmm. at World War II, right, the timeline split uh, because in the Tarantino verse, Hitler is killed in a very dramatic fashion in a movie theater. They make a movie about it that Rick Dalton is in and everything changes in their universe, right? Uh, There are much more violent, uh, uh, you know, violence forward culture than Mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, (laughs) our culture is very violence forward, I would say, especially in our cinema, but they're, they're even much more, they're more pulpy than we are, if you will. We'll talk more about the Tarantino cinematic timeline in his alternate universe. Mm -hmm. But I, this is so interesting to hear that, you know, what were they talking about? uh, P Walter Hauser uh, for this. Yeah. Yeah. We don't really know who wasn't confirmed. Yeah. We we didn't have any confirmation on the film, like who would be in it. Uh, Yeah. Tarantino had kind of mentioned like, Oh, I really like Paul Walter Hauser, like kind of what he's Mm -hmm. doing. And, Based on the description of this movie critic character, I think that's probably a good casting choice. There was also a rumor that Brad Pitt would be reprising his role from Once Upon a Time Out in Hollywood in this movie. And I imagine, like, if they were going to do this movie, they would also include, like, Rick Dalton, right? Wouldn't Leo come back as Rick Dalton? Leo DiCaprio. I mean, that ups the budget pretty significantly, but it does up the box office. Maybe, like, I'm wondering why Tarantino pulled the plug on it. It does kind of seem like a type of story that could kind of codify his universe's boundaries. Right, like he, you could revisit all of these movies mm-hmm. and all of this history, and this film historian could be Tarantino as himself, as like putting himself in the movie, kind of cataloging all of this history and all these great movie titles, and like you know, Tarantino used to work in a video rental store, right? right? That's yeah, kind yeah. of his mythology he could be like this guy who's also submitting reviews for all these like b movies and he's kind of walking you through but then somehow gets inserted into the drama the way that like cliff booth was a stunt actor who got inserted into the history of the of the summer 69 the the murders of the manson family right um and so like maybe he gets there's some kind of like hollywood caper big lebowski type story where he just gets involved in this crime drama as like you know maybe uh Dalton and Booth are mad about some review he wrote or there's some like studio <laughs> executive who's like gonna kidnap him unless he like find you know there's all kinds of places you can imagine Tarantino as someone who mythologizes the 70s in Hollywood as this transitional place right and you gotta imagine 1977 such perhaps the biggest nexus point in Hollywood because that was the arrival of the new generation of Hollywood filmmakers of George Lucas and Spielberg and De Palma and Scorsese. And before that, like, you know, Tarantino loves what it was right before that. And I think he considers like 1969 and 1977, probably the biggest nexus points in Hollywood history. 69. It's just when the sixties died on that night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can imagine with once upon a time in Hollywood, he's flipping that to where he's like, well, what if, the 60s never had to die uh, <laughs> right. on that night. What what if like we were able to keep the party of the 60s going? And I think that's what Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was to him. It's like his chance to kind of reimagine what the 70s would look like if it didn't die on 69. And it continued up until 77. And maybe he could have had this like historical nexus point where you have the new generation of filmmakers out of USC coming in wanting to change everything up. But still you have like people like Rick Dalton who are like, no, I'm not letting go of the Westerns. And he doesn't die. And then I don't know, like maybe there's a young Stevie Spielberg and a young Marty Scorsese who are like just getting beaten up by Cliff Booth. <laughs> He's not having it. He's not having it. Yeah. I mean, I want to yeah. see, I would love if in this movie, yeah, they revisit not only Rolling Thunder, but yeah, he does recreate these movies these movie moments. I mean, can you imagine a star Wars with Rick Dalton as your Han Solo instead of like Harrison Ford? Like, <laughs> right? Insane. That's exactly what insane. it would be. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it's like Rick Dalton is almost like the Clint Eastwood of this world, right? He was, yeah, he's, well, or like a Steve McQueen, right? Cause that's who he Steve replaced McQueen in the great better, escape, yeah. right? He's playing right, Steve right. McQueen's role. So it's like, and that's what's crazy about those shots. They recreated so it good. so perfectly. Those shots in The Great Escape. It's almost like what Zemeckis did with Forrest Gump. Right. And putting Tom Hanks yeah. to these historical t- Like, But it looks so good. And it, was, it wasn't It was like he used VFX to do it. He just used the same film stock that they used. Mm-hmm. And they had DiCaprio just like reenact the blocking. And the precision that DiCaprio uses, he gets Steve McQueen's blocking exactly in that scene from The Great Escape. Right. Yeah. I mean, it... it 
I, I'm excited for whatever Quentin's going to bring up next, you know, uh, but I hope this movie doesn't go away all the way. You know, I hope he doesn't just yeah. let it go. Like, because there are other ways that he can kind of extend this last movie, right? This 10th movie thing is something that he put on himself. And I don't know, this this feels like a, a, a thing a younger Quentin was saying. And at, now as he approaches it, he's getting scared, right? Because right. uh, you can watch an interview with uh, Conan from a few years ago. I think he was promoting... Uh, it might have been both might have been the hateful eight. I wasn't sure what he was promoting when I was watching it, but like he was talking uh-huh. to you know, Taren- or Conan brings it up. Oh, you're gonna do, do 10 films, and like Tarantino's like, well, maybe 11 or you know, 14 or something, but yeah, like, uh, not, not much more than 10, you know, because his whole reasoning is like, if you can just have like 10 good movies and like that's your whole oeuvre, uh, and you really nail it, like that's great. And you know, he kind of calls out that like other directors, they keep going and maybe the movies get a little worse and they're not as great as they used to be. But he, you know, this dream of just having like, I have these 10 great movies that really just show what I am. Like he loves that idea, but I, I'm sure he's also scared of it too, in a lot of ways. Uh, what was really funny uh, last year or was it earlier this year, I think in March, Luke Besson, uh, the director of like The mm. Fifth Element, uh, uh-huh. he was saying that Quentin stole that idea from him. That he was talking, what? he was talking to a young <laughs> Quentin Tarantino, and he was like, "You know, what you should do is you should do like ten movies. Like that's what I want to do." Now, Luke Besson has made like twenty some odd movies now at this point, uh-huh. but he w- like uh, in March he was like, "Yeah, Tarantino stole that idea from me. That, that was my idea, and he took it from me." And it's like, "All right, Luke I Besson, get that. out of here." We're tired of you. I love that. I mean, look, you know, uh, I think Nolan was even interviewed about Quentin Tarantino's plan for ten movies, and he's like, "Eh." Why? Yeah, why like, quit? Need to stop? Yeah. Why quit? Like, that's that's a very yeah. young man thing to think that like, oh, the old guard, they they lose it after the years. But you only right. get better. I mean, you're learning. You're 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 taking your ideas into a the future. You know, we need you to keep putting out that art. I, I remember when um, yeah, maybe Clint Eastwood isn't the best example for this. <laughs> I mean, like, they're all problematic right, at some point. They're all pretty bad. But or no, I mean, look, he made Mystic River and he made mm-hmm. Million Dollar Baby, and those are really. Good yeah. movies. I haven't rewatched them in a long time, so maybe they don't hold I up. Can, but... I can't rewatch Million Dollar Baby. Never again. Uh, yeah. I mean, I watched, speaking of Paul Walter Hauser, I mean, I watched Jewel, the Richard Jewell movie. That was oh, pretty was good. That? It wasn't bad. It was good? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I've seen it made fun of on Twitter, so I'm afraid to watch it. You know, I but... think it, it, it's like a it's like a really good uh, made-for-TV movie about a historical okay. thing that happens. You know what I mean? I mean, some of uh, Clint Eastwood's movies, like Trouble with the Curve, I just thought were just so yeah, bad. Yeah. Like Trouble with the Curve came out the same year as Moneyball. Sully, Sully like, wasn't bad. I liked Sully. Oh, Sully! No, Sully was bad, dude. <laughs> Sully has like one good sequence, and then it just gets Anna Gunn to yell at Tom Hanks for two hours. And I mean, like, like, what, what better is movie this? is there for uh, an arbitration meeting with an insurance company? <laughs> you tell me. You tell me. <laughs> This used to be the most fun meal, and then at some point the world decided that a cup of coffee and a banana should replace cereal, but that was before Magic Spoon put cereal back on the table. Magic Spoon is a cereal reinvented. It's the same great taste that you remember, but upgraded with grown-up ingredients. There's nothing artificial. It's high-protein, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free, and naturally flavored. Mm. I'm keto, so I love these cereals. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is maple waffle, and it actually is really good. It's actually really good. Oh, my God. (laughs) Magic Spoon cereal has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four to five net grams of carbs in each serving, and only 140 calories per serving. If you're on the go and need a cereal bar instead, each Magic Spoon cereal bar has one gram of sugar, 10 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and only 130 calories per bar. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own custom box with all the flavors you love and use code NEWROCKSTARS for $5 off. You can choose from the best-selling cocoa, fruity frosted, peanut butter, and maple waffle flavors, plus other awesome flavors including honey nut, blueberry muffin, birthday cake, cinnamon roll, and chocolate chip cookie. You can also add any of their delicious cereal treats to your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code and use the code new rockstars for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash new rockstars to save $5 off your order today. Also for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon ships to Canada and the UK. 
So, yeah, I think there's all kind of reasons why Tarantino would pull the plug here. I think, obviously, it's what we're talking about, right? He wants to keep making movies, and he doesn't want this to be his final one. But there's got to be something about the movie critic where he's like, Ugh, now is not the time to make this movie. Maybe he still wants it to be his final movie, but he's got other stories he wants to tell ahead of time. And I don't know, maybe there is something that's like controversial where he's like, I don't want to piss off Spielberg and De Palma. Yeah, kind of <laughs> talk shit guys. about them. Maybe he's going to wait. Yeah. He's going to outlive them a little and <laughs> then start doing it. I don't know. I mean, there, there was an interesting element of this too, I found in my research, research that they were going to actually shoot one day of this movie in August of this year mm -hmm. to qualify okay. for a $20 million California tax credit. Oh. Uh, before actually going into production in 2025. So like, uh -huh. that's kind of why there were these news stories earlier this year that like, oh, he's about to go into pre-production or whatever, because they were just going to shoot for a day to get this like $20 million tax credit and then finish the movie in like 2025 and then I guess have it out in like 2026. So I see. whatever plan, I mean, I think he really had to scrap it now because he was coming up against the wire of like, if I'm going to shoot uh -huh. something, I need to have a script. I need to have an idea of what I'm making here. So... I bet part of the reason for pulling the plug was like, well, I'm not going to meet this like tax deadline thing. I'm going to have to rethink because this movie did not have a, a movie studio behind it yet. He put out mm. uh, his, I mean, a lot of his movies came out through the Weinsteins. Uh, That's right. And Miramax, Miramax produced most of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was through Sony. And then most people uh -huh. assume that Sony would just do this one too. Cause why not? You got to do whatever you wanted in that movie. They put it out. Mm. No problem. And I would imagine any studio would, any studio seriously consider his movie yeah. right now and yeah. it makes me think a move a studio like universal right that stole away nolan from wb would yeah. love to get a piece of this movie i mean this is yeah. this is a hot movie that everyone's going to want a piece of so i don't think he's going to have a hard time selling it regardless of what the content is i think anyone would want tarantino's last movie this opens the door now though for the quentin tarantino cinematic oh, universe baby. just go deeper now you mentioned and you and i were talking about this at the inkwell that like they're is a uh an argument that it that world war ii was the nexus point right. for his universe but could we even go back further and look at Django unchained as maybe oh, the origin okay because chronologically that's the earliest so it would be right. Django unchained then hateful, hateful eight, eight and then you'd get uh inglorious bastards right so i wonder hmm. is there an argument to be made that Django was such of a mythological folk hero and a larger than life figure who overthrew the slave masters uh that that could have set america on a bolder more progressive course of history I like this of 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 uh drawing the first blood yeah in conflicts, about pushing you know? about not being afraid to resort to violence to overthrow right. an evil uh dictatorship of some form right like not being yeah. afraid to fight back uh, now, Hateful Eight is kind of in its own bubble because clearly that was Quentin Tarantino just trying to remake John Carpenter's The Thing, sure. but set in the Old West, even getting Kurt Russell down there. And it's like a who's who kind of we're all cold and pissed off and we're confined in this location. So I don't know how that would impact history that much. Right. But yeah, definitely, you know, an argument has been made by people long before us that Inglorious Bastards was the moment ending World War II in a movie theater, killing the the Nazi regime uh, in a movie theater. Uh, and um, like that carnage happening there just would have uh, like things would have been impacted in history in a very different way. You'd have a lot more like movie lovers, movie theaters would be like rock concerts, you know, uh, and people would love violence. And then Rick Dalton would just have a, a career that he wouldn't have had yeah. otherwise. And because that happens, Rick Dalton makes that movie and is able to stop the Sharon Tate murders with the same flamethrower from that movie that was in real life used right. to kill Hitler. So it's like this idea of these elements of the movie <laughs> become real like last action hero we literally pull them out of the screen right. and we use them in our world to prevent even more violence it's crazy it, it, it's crazy stuff now you have to uh wonder now we get to the 90s right with reservoir dogs mm -hmm. and with pulp fiction and here's where people start to do what like the our friends the super carlin brothers do with their extended universe pixar theory of how some you have like two levels of reality you have the main reality and then you have like the in-universe um, reality of the movies and TV shows that these right. characters watch.
watch. So um, in Pulp Fiction, Mia Wallace pitches the Fox Force mm-hmm. Five, which is basically the setup for the Kill Bill film. Right. So five female assassins, and she's one of them. Um, but you know, her character is slightly different. She does have like one liners and I don't know if the bride, if Beatrix Kiddo has that many one liners, or at least she's not the version of the character that Mia Wallace talked about. Well, and I think Mia Wallace is saying she auditioned for like a show, right? It was more like a Charlie's Angels type show. So maybe in this world, like that show doesn't happen, but they make the movie Kill Bill instead, right? Because right, right. And we're talking about not made for TV, it's made for film, right? Because the violence crazier. in that film, even though the violence in the Kill Bill universe is so big and bloody and big, that movie it's like they cut off a head and the blood squirts like a sprinkler, right? right? It's it's so yes. over the top that it right. that it must not be like the real real. So yeah, I like that idea that like Kill Bill is a movie within the the Kill Bill universe or the Tarantino universe. And then people will say like, oh, but they have like the Apple cigarettes in the in Kill Bill. So that must make it real. And you have the Vega brothers. Right, Vincent right. And, but that yeah. you, you there's a couple arguments there. Is Pulp Fiction like also a movie within that universe, or is Pulp Fiction oh. real? You know, if the Vegas Well, so she's but the but Mia Wallace is a character in Pulp Fiction. That's How is she? Two movies. <laughs> <laughs> some of the storylines in Pulp right, Fiction right, right. are real. Some of them are movies. Right, right. Um, yeah, so uh, there's like the question of Jackie Brown. Like now, Jackie Brown would exist in America where there was a Django legend, sure, right? Sure. So what does that say about the world that Jackie Brown is living in? Just interesting to think about. And so what would be the most modern? I guess, Pulp, uh, no, uh, the Kill Bill films would the be Kill like Bill the most The Kill Bill films would probably be the most modern, yeah. Or Death Proof. Yeah. Death Proof. Uh, Death yeah, Proof is Death pretty Proof modern. Well, because Stuntman Mike is the killer in Death Proof, right? And we see him. Mm. We see a stuntman in. We see Kurt Russell plays a stuntman named Mike in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He's the one there that flies Cliff Bluff, right? So does that mean yeah, does yeah. that character go on to become a killer, or is Death Proof a movie based on Stuntman Mike and he gets to play himself in that movie? Do you think because oh, Death Proof was a movie a for? The Grindhouse double feature, yes. right? Which features also uh-huh. Planet Terror from Robert Rodriguez. So is that mm-hmm. saying that these are movies that they would be shown in the Tarantino universe? Because that movie also, remember, featured fake trailers, one of which was Thanksgiving, which became a real mm-hmm. movie. One of one which was Machete. Machete, which became a real movie. <laughs> so it's like, are those movies fake in the Tarantino universe? And do technically Thanksgiving and Machete and Machete Kills, are they fake movies in the Tarantino universe also? Yes, uh, yes. That we the just answer get to see? Yes. <laughs> a thousand times a yes. A thousand times yes. <laughs> they must be, right? right. That's all. Like, I think the Death Proof Planet Terror Grindhouse feature is what really blew this theory wide yeah. open because Tarantino is basically saying that there are all these other movies that exist in universe yeah. to this feature. Um, a Hateful Eight could even be seen that way as just sure. like kind of a proof of concept of just like, what if instead of John Carpenter's The Thing, the the version of The Thing that inspired the 50s version of The Thing was this old Western tale of these, like, these these killers who were all trapped in a cold cabin. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I like that a lot. You know what's great about this universe is there's, it's all set on Earth. There's no, uh, there's no magic, there's no space, uh, there's no robotics. It's all just humans killing each other and being inspired by movies to kill. And, you know, it is all set on Earth, but we do know that there was a rumor for a while that Tarantino wanted to do a Star Trek movie, you know? That's so now right. that now that the 10th movie is up in the air, do you think he goes back to Star Trek at all? I don't want to see Tarantino's Star no, I Trek. I don't want to either. <laughs> I want it to happen. It, I would love to read the script. In the way script. that I, I, I want to watch a car accident. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would love to read the script, or I'd love to see his storyboards, but I want it to be like Jodorowsky's Dune. I don't. Yeah. I want a documentary the legend about of it. it. I don't want to see The it. legend of it is greater than anything that can be made, right? <laughs> it's just so good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, he, you looked up all the movie uh, TV episodes. He's directed right. quite so, a bit of TV. So yeah, if you don't know, like Tarantino, movie director, movie writer, right? But he's also done a lot of other little things here and there. You know, he he's he's listed as like a guest director on the movie Sin City, which mm-hmm. uh, Robert Rodriguez did, and famously left the WGA because he wanted to give co-directing credit to Frank Miller because he basically used the Sin City comics as a storyboard for the movie. And he's like, this guy directed the movie. The WGA was Mm -hmm. like, you can't have two directors that aren't married or aren't related. So he left the WGA because he did that. He was able to bring in a bunch of directors to help on the movie. So uh, Tarantino was one of those, but Tarantino has done some television. 
directing. He famously directed an episode of ER. And he also directed the series finale of CSI, which is just a wild thing to do. Like That's incredible. It, just what a, what a flex, just to be like, ah. But that, that made me think, like, this guy should just direct more TV. Wouldn't you love to see a Tarantino TV series? Of, like yeah. an anthology of anything that he wants to I do. Would, I would watch it. I would absolutely watch it. But I feel like nowadays, TV is not even TV anymore. It's, it's just streaming movies, platforms. Yeah. <laughs> and it seems like Tarantino hates it. Mm. Like he is one of these directors who will never work with Netflix. And I, I'd be curious to pick Tarantino's brain about David Fincher, one of our greatest living directors who has sold his soul to Netflix. And it, it's such a shame to see because David Fincher, like... The last movie Fincher made that really mattered was Gone Girl. Yeah. Like, nothing against Mank or The Killer. I perfectly enjoyed them, but I watched them and never thought about them again. And if you release those movies on big screens, people would be talking right. about them differently. And they, 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 they did go on big screens, but it was, like, very limited. And it was not it was limited. They're not paying it to, like, like, advertise it that way. They're just doing that right. so they can submit for awards. Like, Mank could have been that movie's Oppenheimer. Yeah. You know? It is, it is so good. And it's just, like, they don't matter because you only watch them on Netflix. So, yeah, uh, the fact that TV, in order to be a TV director, you have to just, like, make stuff that's weirdly yeah. cinematic, but it's on, like, potentially crappy TVs, and and who knows where the streamer is going to sell it to in the future. Right. I, or yeah, if you'll even I have just, the rights to it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It does say on IMDb, now it's not always 100% accurate, right? But it does say he's listed as in, like, pre-production as a director and producer and writer for Bounty Law which was a real serialized TV show from the 60s and 70s that in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you see Rick Dalton is in an episode of it. That's where we get the famous, the meme, the pointing meme. Yeah, yeah. He's watching himself yeah, on Bounty Law. Uh, yeah. And it sounds like Tarantino wants to revive that show and maybe bring it back. So it's like, this could be an, <laughs> an avenue for him, right? Like reviving old serialized t- television that he loves. Because this guy, I mean, it's clear, Tarantino is chasing the dragon of his childhood, right? Of being mm-hmm. young, watching movies, having your mind just exploded. He loves the 70s and the 60s. It's very clear. Even as even as most modern movies have the pastiche of like a 60s mm-hmm. or 70s film, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Even like Pulp Fiction, which I think is like set in the 90s. It's just like, you. it's kind of timeless because they, the way they dress, the way they act, the way they speak. Right. He's obsessed mm-hmm. with that and he loves that. Uh, and he loves this like universe building I mentioned it earlier, his video archives podcast. If you haven't listened to it, it's very dense, like film bro stuff. I think he does it with the the guy he worked with at that video store, uh, who he wrote Pulp Fiction with. Um, they they recently last year, you know, Tarantino announced that Rick Dalton has died. Uh, the actor right. Rick Dalton in his timeline lived to 2023 and then died. And then on that podcast, they spent two episodes doing uh, like a obituary where they talk about all of his roles leading up to the events of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and then what he did after that. He kept making TV shows and movies after that. So it's like, Tarantino could spend the rest of his life making these, for all I care. Because if he considers (laughs) Kill Bill Volume 1 and Volume 2 one movie, if he makes like a Kill Bill 3, right, does that technically not his 10th film? So if he makes a sequel to Once Mm. Upon a Time in Hollywood, is that not his 10th film? Can he keep cheating and not doing an official number 10 until it's a fully new property? Yeah, if he does a, a Kill Bill Volume Three with Maya Hawk, Ooh, uh, okay. Uma Thurman's daughter Ooh. playing her daughter, yes. Beatrix Kiddo's daughter, yes. grown up. I don't know if Uma would let her daughter work with mm. Quentin Tarantino. She'd say, "I want to see the stunt doubles the immediately." <laughs> yeah, right, right. and she's keeping her <laughs> shoes on the whole time. Uh, right. Yes, but if it's if it's uh, Volume Three, would that still be considered part of the the Kill Bill? I mean, movie, I think you right? would because there were always rumors. I don't know how true this was. There were rumors that. You know, famously in Kill Bill Volume 1, spoiler alert, uh, when the bride, whose name we don't know yet, she kills uh, one of her uh, uh, one of her teammates, and the daughter sees it. She tells the Bernita daughter. Green. Yeah, yeah, 10 years She tells the daughter, right? if, you, if you get something in you and you want to come get revenge, I totally understand, and you're well within your rights. And supposedly Tarantino shot some stuff with the little girl then mm. that he could use later for a movie later he claimed like oh yeah we shot some stuff that like if we ever wanted to revisit it we can't so like it's there and i think if if the movie contains even iota of something that was shot as part of the original kill bill it's still part of the same movie so i think you can yep, i think you counts. can count it that way it counts as like one still one movie so either kill bill volume three uh for the next movie mm-hmm. uh or something with the vega brothers 
Get uh, Travolta and Michael Madsen together. They're both so old. I don't know. They're both so old. I mean, they're not that old, but they live hard lives. (laughs) (laughs) Can we say maybe since Rick Dalton is dead and I don't think his obituary included any mention of anything that would have happened in 77 Mm. that was part of my pitch for, uh, for the movie critic. But what if the story of the movie critic is this movie critic wanting to write this obituary for Rick Dalton, but like people are pressuring him to leave out the story of how Rick Dalton beat the shit out of these young directors in order to like preserve his legacy. <laughs> Dude, Rick Rick Dalton beat the shit out of Steven Spielberg would be a movie I see immediately. Like 26-year-old Steven Spielberg like walking around the Get lot. Get the kid who played him in The Fablements. Oh! <laughs> Dude, if he brings The Fablements into the Tarantino universe, I, I, I'll yeah. lose it. I'll Dude, lose link it. The Fablements, then we could do a thumbnail with Paul Dano as does he know <laughs> that he's about to get hit? In the face by Rick Dalton. Does if Rick Dalton beat the shit out of Steven Spielberg, does he ever do Ready Player One, or is he just like, no, I'm, <laughs> he not remembers. Touching it. I'm not touching it. Like maybe it just opening shot of of the movie critic is the final shot of the Fablemans of just the young kid like in the camera tilts up from when David Lynch as John Ford is like it's it's shit if it's not, if the horizon's in the middle. And then so he he does a happy walk, yeah, yeah. and then Rick Dalton just comes in and just sucker punches him. Oh man, uh, uh, Rick Dalton going through the directors of the seventies would just be incredible, incredible stuff. Wanna, yes, Rick, I'd watch Rick it. Dalton is in is in the Twilight <laughs> Zone movie and saves the kids. Oh my god! <laughs> He's like, "You shut your fucking mouth, Landis. We're not filming at night. This oh set is god. not safe." Oh man, then Max Landis would just have an even bigger <laughs> career than he does. Is that what we want? No. <laughs> oh no, that's not what we want. <laughs> I feel like I feel like with the Max Landis tie in there, we have confused like the the four viewers right now who understood every reference that we brought up to Hollywood history in this episode. We've lost we, them. We might have lost them. How with, is Max Landis one. connected to this? Um, <laughs> we know we well, never this, get right burned because we do because never <laughs> never. <laughs> These are the conversations that uh, we have in the Inkwell Tavern it's in true. Burbank. So you gotta you gotta hit up the Inkwell because that's these are the kind of Hollywood history <laughs> deep dives you'll get. That's right. But before we continue, uh, just a quick preview of what's coming up this week on the New Rockstars channel. Our breakdown of X Men ninety seven episode seven, The Bright Eyes episode, Oof. will be coming out Thursday. X-Men I'm scared. I'm scared for every episode I'm of X Men now. <laughs> I'm just like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what wild swing it's going to take now. Um, we are continuing forward with Star Wars Bad Batch Breakdowns Episode 14. That's the penultimate series episode. Uh, our breakdown will come out on Wednesday. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're revisiting the Fantastic Four movies from the aughts. Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer breakdown is coming out Saturday. Um, interestingly, costs more but made less yeah. than the previous film. Maybe better than uh, the first film? We'll have to yeah, see. Yeah, I believe we'll people, see. yeah, most people remember it more fondly. I feel like, because especially at that time with superhero movies, when they got a sequel, the second one was always better because you're like, we're through the origin story. Now we can just see some some powers going off, right? Like, I always thought X2 yeah. was better than the first X Men. I always thought Spider Man 2 was better than the first Spider Man because it's like we want to get into the action. We all know how mm-hmm. these people got their powers. Let's just get into it. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, now, for those of you who have been waiting for our Fallout mm. uh, series breakdown, Jessica is still working on it. It's a long series, there's a lot to dig into. Uh, Jessica took some time off this week, but we're working on it. It's coming out. It's going to be a great video. So, thank you for your patience. Uh, and I believe I was supposed to have it out this weekend, <laughs> the deep dive of Return of the King. It had to get delayed just a little bit, but it's going to be coming out maybe in in the next two days, maybe by sure midweek, it will be out on the channel. And then I'm going to make my announcement of what next film series I'm going to be doing. So a lot of exciting things coming up this week. Uh, but we want to close out with our segment of what we're watching. watching. And uh, here's our chance to talk about some other like, weird crap we may have just watched either on the internet or other TV shows we're watching or video games we're playing, just other stuff we're consuming that we may not talk about normally on the New Rockstars channel, but here's our chance to talk about it. Brandon, what have you been watching? Oh, I think I talked about this the last time I got to do a sneak peek with Jessica, uh, but we just I just finished uh, this week episode uh, nine of Shogun, the, the penultimate episode oh, of Shogun. Yeah. Shogun is incredible. If you haven't been watching it, it's on uh, Hulu. Uh, 
which is now on Disney Plus. I think you have to have a subscription. I'm very confused how it all works. Uh, but it's on Hulu. It's an FX show. Uh, Shogun's incredible. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, also, I finally got around to the series finale for now of Curb Your Enthusiasm, supposedly done. Mm. I don't know how people feel about Curb. You know, uh, I don't know if my wife likes it that much, but I, uh, you know, every episode is just, there's always screaming and I don't know why, but man, I really get into it. Maybe it's because my old love for Seinfeld, because it just feels like Seinfeld never ended with that show. Like it's just mm-hmm. more Seinfeld and it's just, yeah, I can take it's Seinfeld West Coast. Yeah. The, Larry David and Susie screaming at each other just never gets old to me. I don't know why. Yeah. I just love it. Yeah. It's awful, but I love it. I don't know. I've I've only seen sporadic episodes of Curb over the years, and I just need to go back to the beginning. The, I, 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 I recommend it, Eric, because it really is fun. <laughs> and anytime I'm on an airplane, there's always like episodes of Curb, and I'll just watch any episode. But I recommend to anyone, if you haven't watched the episode of Curb where he redid the Seinfeld ending, and it's basically mm-hmm. a new episode of Seinfeld. It's really great. It's it's a great couple of episodes, that little arc. Also, the arc where um, uh, uh, Larry David starring in The Producers is incredible. Um, <laughs> it's worth it just to watch the episode where he uh, goes on stage uh, in The Producers, and it's it's pretty incredible. Um, but I, I really like that show. It, it really speaks to me as an old man, so... Uh, very enjoyable for me. What about you, Eric? What have you been watching? I, I told Jessica last week I've been watching The Traitors, the, the Alan Cumming reality show where it's basically like murder or mafia or werewolf or one of those. Um, so, But I'll say this week, when Conan O'Brien appeared on uh, Hot Ones. Okay, let's talk about that. The My, like, uh, I loved it if for no other reason than... It reminded me how great Conan is and how much I missed him. And I just think like it just sent me on this uh, deep dive into past Conan bits. And he's like probably more than any other one famous person. What got me interested in comedy Mm -hmm. watching again with my brother, just watching these old late night episodes and just staying up late, hoping that either this episode would contain the Walker, Texas Ranger lever or Pierre Bernard recliner of rage. I would just pray that we would get or comic the insult comic dog. Yeah, I, uh, I I never was that into the year two thousand bits. Oh, that was one of my, my favorite. I always loved it. I know people love bits. it. To me, that was like two Letterman. Like that was like top ten Letterman. I was just like I just got into for whatever reason the Walker Texas Ranger Lever and Pierre Bernard. But I would I appreciated the year two thousand. And what I liked about it is that even after two thousand, they kept yeah they kept doing it. it. I I yeah. always loved the bit where they were driving. Uh, the desk. Was oh, they would drive the desk out into the. Yeah, that was so um, funny. All all of his they, remotes were always so good. You know, yes. I'm very. I haven't watched his travel show yet, but I'm very. I think it comes out this week, or it's already out on on Max. Um, yeah, but yeah, that that hot ones appearance was what a tour de force, and like what a guy, and like what a guy <laughs> chugging bottles of hot sauce, like dumping it on his hand, the chick, yeah. the chicken bones in the pocket. One of his writers being a doctor, <laughs> like just incredible. Like Sean Evans didn't know what to do, and it was just beautiful. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, the guy is is incredible. I really like his podcast. I listen to it a lot. I, I like that he's been able to do long form interviews, and they've been great conversations. I really recommend on his podcast. If you haven't listened to this, Eric, um, he so him and Robert Schmeigel wrote a script for a Hans and Franz movie back in the nineties that never got made. Um, and so him, Conan O'Brien, Robert Schmeigel, Kevin Nealon, and Dana Carvey came on the podcast. They made like five or six episodes of these, and they would read segments from the script and talk about what they were going to do in the movie. And this movie sounded incredible, and it didn't come together because it was going to be Hans and Franz are cousins of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to be in the movie. And like, he was like a main character in the movie. And like, it was very funny and very satirical and all these great references. And then in the last minute, Arnold was down to do it. And the whole movie depended on him because Last Action Hero didn't do so well. Arnold was like, I can't do comedy anymore. They don't want me in the comedies. So like, they pulled out on this movie. And of all of the fucking SNL movies they made. This one would have been incredible. And I love yeah. Coneheads. I'm a Coneheads apologist. But a Hans and Franz movie, you got to listen to that these six episodes where they read, read they read through All the right. script as the characters. They, they constantly call out how old and bad these jokes are. 
<laughs> how old their references are. Like they keep reference making references, and they're like, "Well, that guy's dead now. I can't make that joke anymore." <laughs> it's just like it is. It is a, a great six episodes to listen to because it is just hilarious. Conan is a national treasure and has been working so hard for so many decades. Did you uh, ever watch Look Well? His Look Well pilot was that the one. With Adam West? Oh, yes. I did watch that pilot. It was incredible. Look Well was uh, uh, the pilot that Conan wrote when he was still writing on The Simpsons. I think he was on SNL. This is like he he wrote on the Harvard Lampoon, got hired on SNL's writing staff, then got hired for The Simpsons. And I think around that time is when he was auditioning for Late Night. Oh, okay. Letterman. And so he and Smigel in 1991 wrote this script for, called look well which would have been like a parody of like these rick dalton type yeah yeah it was like a, it was like a cr- with adam west yeah yeah it was like a columbo kind of spoof right columbo like, type like... thing there was a columbo spoof yeah yeah. yeah yeah and then so uh adam west is doing it and you can find the pilot it's on youtube mm-hmm. and it's really fucking funny okay. it almost feels like the the kind of vibe of andy richter controls the universe yes Did that's what i was that? thinking of yeah yeah yeah, it's 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 just super super just funny, just silly and like very yeah. like police story or not police story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could imagine Leslie very, like Nielsen naked gun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so just watching a lot of Conan this week. Oh, honestly, baby. that's that's it's, what I've it's been. It's always up to. good. Conan's always good. You know, one of my favorite bits they did on the show. They didn't do it until he was on TBS. And it's really more of a Will Forte bit. So I'm giving my flowers to Will Forte here. Will Forte would come on as Ted Turner. Writing, yeah, that was on the TBS writing era, right? a stuffed buffalo, and it's every <laughs> single one of them is so funny. You can just there's a, a clip uh, on YouTube where they put them all together, and they're just all great. The the yeah. insults are you know one thing I loved about Conan, his philosophy on his show was always like the show the 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 talk show is always like I'm the straight man trying to keep the show together, and everyone mm. else around me is a maniac. The characters mm. are maniacs. The band leaders are maniac. <laughs> my writers are mm. maniac. Co- you know, it's like, I'm just trying to hold it together. Everyone's a maniac. But when he goes out in the real world, he's always like, I'm the maniac. And everyone else is oh. like the realness. So that's yeah. why in any, all the remotes, he's so wild and crazy. On the show, he's wild and crazy. But he's trying to like keep the show going. He's trying to hold it down. But when he's out in the wild, he's like, all bets are off, baby. Let's go. I love that. Um, the the remote shoots don't apply to this, but basically the whole idea of one person trying to hold the show together with a bunch of maniacs, you know that's the same philosophy as Kermit the Frog on the oh, show. Oh, yeah. Kermit the Frog true. is yes. a straight man just trying to keep the show on the rails, and then everyone else is doing the best that they can to take it off. Okay, I think we've we've to wrap it all up, I think Quentin Tarantino brings back the Muppet show. Boom, <laughs> maybe we're in. This has been one of my favorite episodes. <laughs> this has been great. I can talk Tarantino universe anytime. I don't know how many people are going to like watch or share this episode, but it is just so inside baseball for like Hollywood <laughs> history, and I'm here for it. It's been a delight. Brandon, you're welcome back anytime. Oh, thank you. Uh, everyone, uh, share this video with all your other Tarantino nerd uh, friends. You, you psychos out there yeah, getting drinks us... at Good Time, Davy Wayne's, or wherever you get your, oh, your drinks in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, give us give us your best like connections in the comments that we missed below. What you yeah. think is real in the Tarantinoverse, what you think is a, a movie within the Tarantinoverse. Uh, yeah. yeah, what are we missing here? There's more connections, I know it. Follow Brandon at Grin and Barrick on social media. You can follow me at EA Voss. Subscribe to all three channels of the New York Stars Network and support us by grabbing something from our merch store, nerdriot.shop. And if you have any pitches for a... Uh, Tarantino shirts. Well, don't pitch us. Don't tell us. Don't tell. We won't listen. Because, because send him to Tarantino to if you got a Tarantino. Yeah, send him to pitch. Tarantino. Yeah, he's looking for a movie, folks. All right, guys. Everyone have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye.